Hey, this is Sean Smith, and in this video, we're gonna talk about overcoming negative feedback. One of the biggest reasons that people hold themselves back in business, speaking on stages, relationships, I mean, everywhere, is the fear of negative feedback. And most people are actually trying to get over negative feedback by avoiding negative feedback. It's one of the worst things you can do. See, everybody wants to grow, but almost nobody wants to go through the process of growing. Most people just want the outcome of growing without the growing part, right? Like. I want, I want the growth without the growing pains. I want the growth without the stretching. I want the growth without the actual expansion, but that's not possible. So what you can do though, is just decide that your growth is going to be, is going to look a certain way. It's going to feel a certain way. You can just give yourself a command basically that I will find fun in all of this. I will find joy in all of this. And it's really critical that you don't demand that your growth is going to be easy, that you don't demand that your growth is going to be emotionally neutral, right? Man, so many people are essentially demanding that their emotions be muted. See, what we would love to do, and this is what so many people try to do, is they just try to turn off the negative emotions. But what we have to understand is there's essentially one switch for our emotions and it's either all on or all off. We can't just go in and turn individual dials down of our emotions. We can't just say, I don't want shame anymore. I don't want anger anymore, but I do want fun and I do want joy and I do want bliss, but let me turn down all the negative emotions and turn up all the positive emotions. It doesn't work that way. You're either emotionally present you're emotionally engaged, you're emotionally sensitive, or you're not. And it's, it's an either or. So what we need to realize is that if we try to mute our negative emotions, we are inherently muting our positive emotions as well. And we need both. Now, the only way to actually get the sense that you are turning the dial down on the negative emotions and turning the dial up on the positive emotions is just be willing to open yourself up emotionally. And then over the course of time with some practice, those negative emotions actually don't last very long. So you're not really truly turning the dial down, but you're allowing them to flow in you, through you and from you get it out. You're allowing them to be expressed so they don't last as long and they don't have the control over you that suppressed emotions have. So the net effect kind of feels like we've turned, not necessarily, we've, we, we haven't necessarily turned the dial down on the experience of the negative emotions, but we've turned the dial down on how much they control us. And we've turned the dial up on how much we control the positive emotions. But in order to do that, you've got to go through the work. So that's just a conceptual understanding of emotions in general. On this video, what I want to talk about is our relationship to other people's judgments, other people's opinions, other people's feedback, either individual feedback or collective feedback through circumstances or results. Right? What most of us are doing is holding ourselves back because we're afraid of the feedback of our efforts. I mean, think about it. Why do we not want to do videos? Why do we not want to make phone calls? Why do we not want to commit to a relationship, to a diet? Why do we not want to do the things that we actually want to do? Right? Why do we not want to do the actions to produce the results that we want? I mean, think about this. If there's a result that you want, let's say the result is better health. If there's a result that you want and you have a strategy to get there, if you have the game plan to go where you want, why would this human mind not want to follow the plan? I mean, doesn't it make sense that if we want the outcome that we should want to follow the plan to get to the outcome, it would make sense if our brain transfers the wanting of the outcome to wanting 
of the path, but it doesn't. In fact, quite often, they're complete opposite. The more we want something, the less we want to follow the path, right? Let me know if this is landing for you. Because I'm always trying to be like scientific when it comes to personal development and all this woo-woo, emotional, all this kind of stuff. I'm always trying to, trying to dissect for myself and then I want to share what are the elements at play here? What are the ingredients? We need to understand anything in order to control it. So one of the reasons why we typically uh, don't control our head talk is because we don't understand the head talk. The reason that so many of us don't control our emotions is because we don't understand emotions. You cannot control anything you don't understand. But so many of us are not wanting to look at our pain or look at our traumas or look at our insecurities or look at our faults or look at our imperfections. And if we're not going to look at them, then we'll never embrace them. And if we don't embrace them, we can never control them. We can never change anything that we don't first embrace. Now, when we embrace something, we're not embracing it and saying, I don't want it to change. That's a big misunderstanding that a lot of people make. We're not saying that you have to look at your finances. You have to look at your health. You have to look at your relationships. You have to look at all the areas in life and embrace them as in settling. That's not what we're saying. You have to embrace the existence of your now. Because if you don't embrace the existence, the reality of where you are now, then you'll never have the control to change it in the future. Denial will never give us influence. Denial will never give us the ability to change anything. Denial will never give us empowerment. So what so many of us are doing is we're afraid to look at something and essentially we're denying who we are. We're denying what we've gone through, but then we're hoping that it changes. And you can't, you can't deny your past and then look forward into your future with any level of control. So you're either a victim in your past and in your future, or you are empowered in your past and in your future. You can't be a victim in your past and responsible in your future. But that's what so many of us are doing with our denial strategy. And it's simply because we don't like the emotions that our embracing actually creates. That's not a better strategy. Perpetual denial is not a better strategy than facing and embracing whatever's there so that you can express it, you can let it go, and then be empowered into the future. And here's the reason. If you're not acknowledging something, it doesn't go away. If you're pretending that things didn't happen to you in the past, if you're pretending that you didn't make certain choices in the past, if you're pretending that certain things are not reality for you right now, your pretending actually doesn't make them go away. Which means they're operating anyway. They're operating anyway. So the question is, do we want them to operate with us like this and like this? And eventually the net effect of that is basically this, right? It keeps us from speaking up. It keeps us from having agency in our life. It keeps us from having control over our life because we're denying the existence of who we really are. So would you rather have the suppressed emotions or the traumas or the un- reconciled conflicts or the unlearned lessons, whatever the things are in your body, would you rather them be operating without your knowledge and without your empowerment? Or would you rather look at them and say, listen, the life that I want to live is so big that it's okay. Not only is it okay, but it's a requirement for me to take a look at my current inventory, my current circumstances and change whatever needs to be changed express whatever needs to be expressed, let go of whatever needs to be let go of so I can go there. Yesterday, I talked about climbing Mount Everest and it's a beautiful analogy for personal development. When we're climbing Mount Everest or anything that we're ascending toward in our lives, 
the baggage that we're carrying, the lessons that we haven't learned yet will cause us to stop at whatever point we cannot go beyond until we learn these lessons or until we let this particular conflict go. So essentially, this is all a process of learning lessons and continuing to move, learning lessons and continuing to move. So back to this idea of feedback. We're afraid of the feedback which causes us to not follow the path toward our goals and our dreams. I mean, it doesn't make that like there's no other reason why we would not do the things that we know we should be doing in order to achieve something that we want to achieve. So now let's take a look at the path itself. The reason that most of us are afraid, sometimes terrified at a deep level, at the very least resistant, the reason that we're resistant toward going after our goals and dreams is because of feedback. It's because we don't like the sting of messing up. We don't like the potential of people not liking us. We don't like the potential of people saying something to us. So most, I don't know about most, most people in general, but most people that don't get what they want in life, my philosophy is this. It's because they're more afraid of people's opinions than they are of not living their life's purpose. How can it be anything different? How can it be anything different? If we're not going after what we're made to do, then that means we're more committed to something else. Simple, right? Our commitment to that or our commitment to this. And if we're not going after our goals and dreams, what that means is we're more committed to avoiding other people's judgment or the circumstance called failure. And a lot of times those things go hand in hand. We're more committed to avoiding that than achieving this. Now, why would, be more, why would we be more committed to avoiding that? Because we have an ego to preserve. We have self images that we want to preserve and we have comfort that we're trying to protect. So most of us are protecting our comfort more than protecting our purpose. And what that's going to lead to is a lot of people are going to look back on their lives at the end of their lives and they're going to have to reconcile a certain question. And that question is, why were you more committed to safety than to my dreams? That's a conversation you're going to have to have with yourself. I learned the power of that conversation when I was 13 years old, December 17, 1986, I was riding my bicycle to school and I got hit by a car doing 50 miles an hour. There's no reason I should have survived the accident. If you take a look at all the details, the car went right through me. I flipped over the car and then was nearly hit by other cars that were in the, in the lanes. Later that evening in the hospital, I just had this, this like premonition, this, I saw myself at the end of my life looking back and having the most regret filled conversation. And it sounded like this. I could feel the emotion coming up right now as I'm putting myself there. It sounded like, Sean, what would your life have been like had you not done the drugs or had you not done the participated in the gangs and had you not drank all the alcohol and had you not been so lazy and had you not done this, I envisioned myself living the life of like immense sabotage and regret. And then my soul was asking me how I felt about it. What could your life have been like? And here was the kicker. Who could you have become, Sean? Fuck. That feeling was so deep. And it was the biggest blessing for me because as a 13 year old kid, I learned the lesson of mortality and I experienced my deathbed conversation with myself as a 13 year old. And I've been driven by the fear of that conversation 
ever since. That's why I can still feel it in my body. I've been driven by the fear of that regret for 33 years now. Most successful people I know are more driven by the fear of regret. I'll go into that in a, in a, different, in a different time, but here's the, the, the essential question. If we don't allow ourselves to go after our goals and dreams and we're more committed to safety, then like, what are we actually afraid of? What most of us are doing that don't create the life that we want to create is we are essentially, we're afraid of a sound, right? We're afraid of some version of no. We're afraid of some version of, I don't like you. We're afraid of a sound coming out of a human mouth. And because of that, we let our dreams die inside of us. We let our potential go to the grave right next to us because we're afraid of a sound. We're afraid of a thought that might be going on in somebody else's mind that we'll never have access to anyway. I mean, why do we, with this mind, allow ourselves to be more afraid of a sound coming out of a human mouth, which means nothing at all until we make it mean everything? A rejection, somebody's opinion, somebody's thought, somebody's written word has no meaning in it until we decide that it means everything about us. So how many people are sacrificing their dreams so they don't hear a sound? So they don't think about a thought in another human head that they'll never have access to, ever. So why is that? It's because we have a certain relationship to feedback. And when we hear somebody else's opinion of us, what matters is not what they actually say. What matters is whether it matches what we're already saying. If you tell me that I'm a horrible father, you probably get some response out of me. Because I hope that's not true. And sometimes I have my doubts. But if you tell me I'm a horrible polo player, you've never seen anybody as awful as me and I'm a downright disgrace. I'll be like, okay, I never played polo. I don't, the, the words mean nothing to me because it doesn't match anything already going on in my head. So you could even come at me harder about my awfulness in polo. And you could just barely whisper something like, I think you're a good dad. And I'll just, ca and I could, I could catch on. Oh, she said, think. Oh, that means it might not be true. Oh, that means I wasn't there and I didn't do this. And oh my goodness. And I could just whip myself up into a frenzy. And you even said, I'm a good dad, but I could catch anything I wanted to and attach it to what's already going on in my head and spin me out. I'm sure most of you have this experience where you can have a lot of people say the, the best things about you. You can have a thousand people tell you how amazing you are. And then one person roll their eyes. One person say something that might be a little negative. One person just not give you the positive feedback. They didn't even give you anything negative, but they didn't give you something positive and it spins you out. Why? It's because it matches something that's already going on. So other people's judgments and opinions can only affect us if it matches our own. And I'm going to tell you why that's so critical to understand. I'm going to give you some simple ways to stop this whole process. But another powerful realization is that the human brain actually produces all of its judgments with so many factors. And you know what one of the least important factors is? The thing itself. Meaning, my judgment of you is based on 
mostly all kinds of other things that don't have anything to do with you. You, in fact, are one of the least important variables in my opinion of you. My opinion of you is going to depend on what you remind me of that I've experienced in my past. My opinion of you could be based on my relationship to the truth I see in you, could be based on my value system, could be based on my wanting to be like you, but I don't have the courage to, so I'd rather project all the negativity onto you. My opinion of you actually has very, very, very little to do with you. It's the way our brain works. And so if you are in a circle, in the middle of a circle, and you've got 10 people around you, you will have 10 different opinions of you. So if other people's opinion of you actually has very little to do with you, then how much time and energy should you spend manipulating other people's opinions when you can't anyway? You can't. There are people on this planet who will look at you and despise everything that comes out of your face. Okay. There are other people who need everything that you currently have in your mind. And they will hang on every word that comes out of your mouth. Essentially, your commitment or your choice is, who are you going to be more committed to? Are you going to be more committed to the people that need you? Or are you going to be more committed to avoid the people that don't? Never will. You can't change them anyway. They weren't assigned to you and you weren't assigned to them. So how much energy will we spend avoiding the people that aren't assigned to us? How much energy will we spend trying to be accepted in the tribe that's not our tribe? You know how many times I've been on a coaching call with somebody who's dealing with the fear of rejection and I said, wait, you're being rejected by certain people, right? You're being rejected by a certain crowd. Do you even want to be in that crowd? And the answer is usually no, but they're still bothered by the rejection of the crowd that they don't want to be in. And that's just simply because of the internal conversation that's already going on in the head. So if other people's judgments about us have almost nothing to do with us, then who are we trying to impress and what should we be more committed to? We need to be more committed to the internal assessment, the internal judgment. And our internal judgment about how we live our life will have nothing to do with whether people liked us or not. It will have nothing to do with how many negative reviews we got on paper, on the internet, or verbally, or thinking-wise in people's heads. It will have nothing to do with other people's judgments. So then what if we actually lived like that? If our ultimate opinion of how we lived our lives will have nothing to do with other people's judgment or how many times we failed, then why do we use other people's judgment and the fear of failure as a reason to not do things? It's backwards when you break it apart, but we got to break it apart and then change our relationship to the factors that are holding us back. Please let me know if this is making sense, if dots are being connected for you, because you got to understand what's the actual thing that you're resisting. And for most of us, we're resisting failure, we're resisting judgment, we're resisting negative opinions, we're resisting embarrassment, we're resisting some version of rejection. Ultimately, what we're resisting is self-rejection. Because if you reject me, but I've already accepted me, your rejection doesn't mean anything. But if you approve of me, and I'm rejecting me, then your approval doesn't mean anything. But if you reject me fiercely and I've accepted me, you can't get to me. You might cause me to furrow my eyebrow a little bit. You might cause me to go, huh, I wonder if there's something about that. But you cannot get to me because I got me, because I am self-approved. Now, this is not an easy thing to do. You just flip a switch. 
but it's a process that's possible for all of us. This journey of self-development is possible for everybody, but almost everybody will choose not to. It's possible for everybody. Every single person can heal. Every single person can shift their mindset. Every single person can make progress. Every single person can do this work. Almost everybody will choose not to. And the reason is what we're talking about right now. The reason is the fear of negative feedback. So ultimately, here's the whole goal. The whole goal is to get your conversation right in your head. The whole goal is to focus more on approval of self than manipulating other people's approval of you. Most people are living their lives becoming the chameleon version of themselves in any different environment or any environment to try to manipulate other people's approval. They show up as the version of themselves that they think will be accepted by the people in front of them. So I show up in one room and I become the version that I think they will accept. But then if I go to another room, because I'm so afraid of rejection, I'm going to become the version that I think this new room will accept. But what if in one room I have five different people? Now I need to be five different versions because I need acceptance from him and her and him and him and her. And as soon as that external perspective goes away, I have somebody else that I'm trying to impress. And in the process of all of that, you know who usually doesn't get the attention? Is the person in the mirror. So ultimately, what are we more committed to? If we can strengthen our relationship with ourselves, then we weaken our dependence on anybody's external opinion of us, especially when we realize it has so little to do with us. So little to do with us. And when you sign up for this game of personal development, you'll realize that Confronting your triggers, confronting these internal dialogues that are getting the buttons pushed by other people's opinions and, and feedback is a good thing because you want to know where the lessons are. You want to know where the opportunities to grow are. So if somebody says you're a horrible mom and it lights you up inside with anger and rage and, and, and fear and all the stuff, okay, well, there's a button there. And the question is, do you want that button to operate for the rest of your life unchallenged? Or do you want to know what exists so that you can work on it so that this doesn't affect you at a deep unconscious level? I want my triggers to become conscious to me so that I can work on them. That's my invitation to all of you. What are the triggers that you can work on to continue evolving? So I'm going to leave you with this thought. What would you do with your life if you knew you would fail? but it was still worth it. What thing do you have in your heart, in your soul, in your spirit that's so important for you to get out that it's worth the failure? Because I don't want you to constantly live your life thinking I'm only giving myself permission to do the things that I know I won't fail at. That won't be a life well lived. That'll be a life well protected, but that won't be a life well lived. Both of those questions are valuable. They might produce the same answer. They might produce completely different answers. But what would you do if you knew you would fail, but you got to do it anyway, especially if you knew that failure was part of the process to have that thing evolve in you. So the essence of this question isn't that you know you'll never succeed, but you know you will at least fail for a while in the beginning, but where you got to go is worth it anyway. So I'd love for you to let me know what would you do if you knew you would fail in the beginning for a while, but you got to do it anyway. That's a different voice. Both are important. 
Both must be listened to. And let's just see what comes up. Hey, if you like this video, check out that video right there where I break down the principles of what it takes to actually coach with confidence. Many of us have seen the iceberg, right? The majority of the iceberg is underwater. That's where like 90% or somewhere around there, depending on the studies that, that you listen to, like 